Hey, what's up everyone? My name is Bob Dalton. I am the founder of Sackcloth and Ashes. Uh, Sackcloth and Ashes is a blanket company and for every blanket that's purchased, we donate a blanket to your local homeless shelter. So we donate to over 500 homeless shelters in the United States. No matter where you live in the United States, if you buy a blanket, we'll send a blanket to your local homeless shelter based on your zip code. Bob, what beer are you drinking? That's what we really care about. I don't know. I just said I wanted a lager, and he gave me a beer. I cool. I'm just, a, I'm just here to answer questions. It's a Miller Lite, isn't it? You snuck that in. <laughs> I'm that just kidding. Is that works? You just have to ask for beer, and people bring you beer? <laughs> well, yes. We this is a great panel. deal. I was not informed. Can somebody get these guys a beer? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm on it. All right, Brandon, tell us about you. Um, who got a good newspaper this morning? That's us! Uh, my background is in the world of humanitarian photography, which slowly made its way into social media storytelling, and I worked with a bunch of nonprofits, realized that I was seeing all these amazing stories of impact around the world, only to come home and realize that my friends and my community didn't know these stories. And I was like, how can I share these in a more efficient and effective way? And so we started making a bunch of different tools, and one of them is a print newspaper in 2019, which shouldn't make sense and probably still doesn't, but uh, it, so far it's working. So we're having a good time with it. Uh, and I just want to double down on that. Uh, Brandon, is, he, he's being a little conservative on his story, but he's one of like the OGs of Instagram. And, uh, and back in like 2013, he was like one of the first Instagram influencers, got verified, but he's one of the most wise people that I've ever met. Uh, on social media, and he, he's incredibly gifted, incredibly knowledgeable in how to grow a business through social media. Man, I, I like the, it was like the bio on the bio. That was great. <laughs> All righty, Nia. I follow him. <laughs> My name is Nia Batts. Um, I was born and raised in Detroit, Michigan. Um, Spent my time in New York and LA working in media and entertainment, but some of that work actually brought me back home to Detroit, and I found an opportunity to be a part of community revitalization efforts there in Detroit by way of beauty. Um, beauty has traditionally been this very segregated industry and still continues to be, and our model of Detroit Blows is an effort to create space for women and really all people around these core tenets of non-toxicity, inclusivity, accessible and equitable pricing, and really making sure that as communities revitalize, we have the opportunity to reinvest in them and to essentially create models of business in the world that reflect the values that we have as we you know, continue to, to grow and, and revitalize our American cities. And I just met Nia, and she's freaking <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Joe, how many beers have you had? <laughs> what number is this, buddy? He's like, number seven. I'm kidding. All right, guys, I'm going to kick us off with our first question to get everybody warmed up. I want to know what keeps each of you up at night, and let's imagine two nights. On Monday night, you're kept up by something that is like, got you so jacked and excited out of your mind. The next night, there's something keeping you up that's worrying you or frustrating you or stressing you out. So talk me through what those things are on each of those nights. Uh, you want to start? Yeah. Take it away. So the thing that gets me so jazzed and like keeps me pacing around my living room at night in such an excited way is stories like, I don't know if you guys just saw Shannon sharing up on stage, but it's the stories of people who are living these secretly incredible, oh my goodness, we've got beer delivery. Wow, yeah. oh, Monday oh, night you. delivers. <laughs> Kayla, here Woo. we go, beers for all. Kayla is my jam. Me, she's like, the, I don't know if she's the unsung hero, but she secretly is mine. She's on top of all the logistics and she just brought us beer, so. That's right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, here we go, good job. So, I mean, so Fred Rogers has this quote where he says, when I was a boy and I would see scary things in the news, my mother would say to me, look for the helpers. You'll always find people who are helping. That's the core of what we're doing. And when I see an injustice in the world and find a helper, that's the most exciting thing for me where I'm like, oh my gosh, this is like, let's put all of our energy into supporting this person, celebrating this person so they can keep on doing this important work. But then let's also share this story so that people can feel encouraged and know that there are helpers in every situation. The thing that's kind of terrifying and uh, scary 
Uh, well, first thing is money. I think anybody who's in the social entrepreneur space, it's, you know, it's terrifying when you look at your bank account and you're like, I don't know how we're going to keep on doing this thing, but we know it's important. Uh, the second thing that is most terrifying for me is apathy and cynicism. When I see something bad happen in the news that I don't immediately know where there's somebody working to create a solution, or I see a lot of people saying, you know what, it's not even worth fighting for. It's not even worth doing anything. I don't believe that there's a solution here. And they shut down. That's, that's where, that, that's what breaks my heart. And so that's the driving force behind all of this is that uh, people wouldn't feel that way. They would feel motivated uh, to stay involved, stay engaged, do uh, things that create positive change in the world and not shut down. Yeah, interesting way of phrasing the question, but uh, normally um, when I'm having conversations about people that are trying to discover their purpose, uh, I always say you have to answer two questions. The first question is, what is the craft that brings you joy? And that's the question that wakes you up in the morning. Like, what's the thing that gets you excited? And the second question is rarely ever asked, which is what keeps you up at night? Like, what's the injustice that you absolutely hate? Um, so I think that's just kind of another way of, of phrasing that question. But the thing that kind of like wakes me up and gets me excited is um, communicating messages to like a mass audience um, and inspiring people to do what they're supposed to do, inspiring people to stay true to what they're called to do. Um, you know, for me personally, it's, um, you know, I'm, I'm homelessness is the thing that I'm going around the United States and actually touring and talking about and everything. But the thing that like really wakes me up is like the ability to, to get up and craft a message in such a simple way that people in all different types of audiences, backgrounds, um, perspectives can really take a look at the issue of homelessness and really see it in a fresh light. Uh, the thing that keeps me up at night, uh, a lot of people would think, oh, that's probably homelessness, like the injustice that I absolutely hate. The thing that I absolutely hate is a, a label first society. Um, and so I'm not out to end homelessness. I'm out to end a label first society. And we live in a label first society where we're very quick to just slap a label on people and then claim them as their identity. Um, so for example, foster children. They're not foster children, they're children that are in foster care. Uh, abused woman. It's not an abused woman, it's a woman who has been abused. Uh, homeless person. It's not a homeless person, it's a person that is homeless. Um, we're not creatives, we're people that are creative. And the thing that I, I, I can't stand is that we just slap labels on things um, and we live in a label for society and we have to reverse that into becoming an identity first society. And then we can actually start making some leeway on making a difference in, in our communities. Yeah, I know, we should come. <laughs> Um, let's see, so what keeps me up that I'm excited about? Um, I think, you know, we're, we're one small salon right now in Detroit, and when people outside of the community, when big brands that have resources that they can bring to bear to support the network of women that we support show up and in meaningful ways, I get really excited. And we have one such partnership like that with our friends at Bumble Biz that's going to be launching, I believe, later this week where essentially we're going to be working with them to develop a grant program for entrepreneurs locally in Detroit. And we're going to select three women to come into the salon and live pitch to the Bumble Biz community in Detroit and the Detroit Blows and Detroit Grows community like for actual funding. And you know, starting a business is hard and continuing to maintain it is hard as well. And I was in a position at a big you know, company where we could write very large checks and now I understand what smaller ones do. And so I'm so incredibly excited for the stories of these women that I haven't even met yet and to think about how we might be able to support them and um, to just learn more about the trajectories of their businesses. So I'm just very excited about the opportunities that we have to give back and to do so with partners that recognize that even in a small way what we're doing on the ground. So that, that feels really good. I'm very excited about that. And in terms of what keeps me up at night, um, you know, if, 
salons are the businesses that you know you generally have a significant amount of turnover and so we have to work really hard to make it a place that people want to work and where they can you know make enough money to support themselves and, and their families and I think every time there's a scenario for whatever reason a member of our team has to leave or transition it really does keep me up you start to think what could I have done differently um, there might be plans that you're putting in place, even plans for that individual that haven't come to fruition yet. And it really makes me double down on what our future strategy for growth will hopefully look like in other markets. And we have some investors that are coming to us and we're having conversations around opportunity zones. And we really dig in with them and we think about in these opportunity zones, what are the opportunities we're really trying to create and who are we trying to create them for? And we think about an opportunity for our business to become an investor in real estate in the spaces that we might move into in other markets. And what a scenario looks like where we can bonus our employees based upon the performance and the appreciation of a real estate asset and not just the salon services in the business. Then it starts to get really exciting. And so even in those moments when I might be sad that you know, the time has passed and someone might be moving on and if it especially was a financial reason why we weren't able to continue to work with them, it just fuels me to think about ways in which we can really kind of flip the salon and beauty industry kind of on its head and think about different ways to build like true generational wealth for women in inner city communities. And so that makes me excited but you just you wake up every day and try and figure out how to balance out the nights that you're excited going to sleep and the ones that keep you up for the wrong reasons and just keep going so that you can work the plan right thank you thank you guys that's good all right who wants to ask our second question right here this guy i'm just gonna hand this to you what's the most risky undertaking you've done and what did you learn from it So uh, last uh, September, we were looking at a 10,000 square foot space in Oregon, and we're looking at moving into it. And we were, I, basically, we had a small team with sackcloth and ashes where we hustled out of a Sunday school of a church for four years, and we grew out of it, and then we stayed in it for like two more years, and we were just, like just, over, just overflowing through it, and we're like, fulfilling orders and landing deals with world market and palletizing stuff in the parking lot. And it was just insane. I'm looking at a 10,000 square foot space about a year ago and it's 10,000 square foot space is pretty big. You know, it's, it's almost a little bit smaller than this room. Um, and we looked in it and I was like, man, this looks incredibly large, you know, and that was kind of the risk of it. And we literally only had the, t the money to like build Ikea office chairs and like put them in it. So we had literally had no money to even like build out the space. Like it was just kind of like this giant open space. Um, and we took a risk on it. And a year down the road now, like we're overflowing in that space. And that's pretty much why I'm here in Atlanta right now is we're looking at 10,000 square foot space in Atlanta. And it's another same, exact same identical situation where I'm looking at this empty 10,000 square foot space and I'm having a conversation with my business partner. I'm like, this thing is so huge. Like, how are we going to fill this space? But it was like, it was crazy because we were echoing exactly what we were saying a year ago. And um, I think that a lot of entrepreneurship is just, even when there's times of risk, like the biggest step, like the hardest step is saying yes to it. And once you say yes to it, then it starts to put into fruition, like you start to visualize something actually working out. And, and I think that, you know, this is gonna be a faith journey for us of like, it, there, there's a time to be wise and there's a time to say yes to, to risk, you know? And I, and, I, and I think that the majority of entrepreneurship is saying yes to things that logically are really hard to understand, but you have to say yes to it and then you start to materialize it into existence. Love it. Who else has a question? Kayla. I'd love to know from each of you or one of you, um, what's one piece of the culture that you guys are creating that's like the most important to you and to your employees and people on your teams? Yeah, 
I guess I could answer that. Um, for us, it's, it's beauty as activism. And you know, I have two business partners. One of them, um, her day job is you know, overseeing publicity for a sneaker brand. But before that, she was very much in government and corporate affairs, has a long, rich legacy in Detroit of parents who were activists and community and government leaders. My other business partner, Sophia, is an actress, but I met her as an activist at a social impact conference before I even really knew who she was or had seen any of her television shows. And I think that the three of us, um, even though we've been longtime consumers of beauty services, what really inspired us about what we wanted to create is that it was beauty as activism. Um, you know, working in entertainment, like representation and the images that we put on screens matter. And when you grow up, you know, not seeing images of beauty that look like you or not seeing people that look like you or products that are made for you, you start to feel those tiny microaggressions that feel like an industry in a world is not for you. And in the context of our uh, salon footprint and our team members, we know that every day they have the opportunity to make someone feel beautiful and to feel empowered that come into the salon. And they take that responsibility really seriously. We get to be a part of people's birthdays and weddings and, th and things of that nature that are these really pivotal moments in their lives, but it's also people's funerals or people are that are attending funerals and, and things of that nature and so it really runs the gamut and we really are prideful on making sure that people have like an inclusive um, experience when they come in the salon and that we treat them as humans and really understand like what's going on in their lives and in their days and every one of those interactions has the capacity to feel like a little tiny revolution, and that's the kind of activism that I think we're really passionate about, and it happens one interaction at a time, like between us and our team and our team and how they deliver services to our clients and to the community. I think for us, uh, it comes back to this idea that Jamie Twerkowski shared today, uh, and he first shared with me almost two years ago, uh, and it's the idea that the goal is uh, to move people. You know, with, for Jamie and to write Love Under Arms, you know, their goal is for every tweet, for every shirt, for every blog post to move people. And it's amazing having, you know, we've got a small team and everybody's got their own focus, but you know, on a design front, that means, all right, how can I optimize this design to move people? How can I optimize this caption on social media to move people? How can I you know, make this article not just inspiring, not just uh, encouraging, but ultimately a catalyst towards action. Kindness. Um, in the beginning stages of a culture, uh, it's everything. Like, how you go into something is how that experience is gonna be. And so, when you are building a company, whatever the culture is like five years from now, 10 years from now, is going to be determined by what the culture is like right now. And kindness is everything. The way you treat people, the way you respond to people, like your actual character. And I have a guy on my team right now who's probably one of the hardest workers on my team. He's the creative director of the company. And, um, and we are having a really difficult time with him because he's killing it at his job. He's performing well. He's dominating at his role. But his character needs work. He needs to evolve as a person. And if he doesn't evolve as a person, he's not fit for the culture of our company. And that's how important kindness and character is in the culture of a company. You can perform and dominate your role. You can be talented at something. But if you're not nice to your teammates, if you're not kind to the people around you, if you don't truly treat people with respect and dignity in the workplace, then we're not being leaders of what we're ultimately trying to do, which is to make a difference in the world. And you have to lead internally. Like, if you want to make a difference out there, you got to make a difference in here. And, uh, and that's, uh, that, that's an absolute non-negotiable, absolute something that I will not put up with. If you are not kind to people on the team, you will not work for this company. Um, and so that, to me, when you're building a culture, that's everything. Is you gotta be, you gotta treat your teammates with respect and, and treat them nicely. That'll preach. Bob, do you need another beer? 
I do. You all right? I'm on it. it. I'm no, on I it. Who it. wants to ask another question? <laughs> I'm going to get the beer. Who, who wants to ask? All right, here we go. Hi. Um, Nia, you just touched on this in your last answer um, briefly about um, one of your business parts or partners having a day job elsewhere outside of the work you do. Um, I don't, I haven't done the research on each of you, so I apologize for not knowing um, how you've made that work or what that looks like today in your life and in the lives of your kind of most prominent coworkers and business partners and people who are supporting you. But um, especially as you were starting out or even now, what does that look like for you? Um, do you have a day job or another? Is this your day job? And if this is how you kind of pay your bills and support yourself and your loved ones, then um, how do you handle, how do you, how do you have, how do you view um, the money you're making and, and where do you kind of um, draw a healthy line for taking care of yourself and your family and your people and also um, pouring back into the work you're doing? I'm super he interested in hearing your answer, but I also have an answer too. Okay. Um, for me, I had the benefit of working in this big corporate environment that allowed me to save in ways that may not have been possible in another scenario. So I initially had a little bit of runway to try and figure out like how to make this work. Um, and because of that, I think I did something that a lot of founders like probably do, which is not writing yourself into the budget for any type of kind of salary operational stipend. It's something that I probably regret because what did end up happening is I thought I was going to be really in the day to day for probably three months of construction, three to four months of getting it up and running. And then I would essentially like, you know, my business partners have to resume, you know, the job that essentially funds, you know, pays the bills and the overhead and, and so on and so forth. And what ended up happening, as all things, is that it took much longer and it was much more work and it really necessitated me being in Detroit and not being back in New York or LA. And so I had to recalibrate a little bit and really dive in. And so as I was sort of operating as that kind of day-to-day -day CEO, having more operational responsibilities than I was expecting, I also had to grapple with the fact that I had not anticipated essentially being um, in a non-income generating role for so long. And so there are times when I started to do like a little bit of consulting. Sophia and I still have a production company that we operate as well. Um, but when I was doing a lot of this consulting work and I was flying around and um, you know doing things for other companies, what I found is that inevitably my company was the one that suffered. And where I might have had the opportunity to put more resources into it or to do different things, like there's really nothing like actually being able to be there to drive those strategies. And so one of, I think, my regrets in terms of how we raised money is I didn't really develop a plan that allowed it to be sustainable for me as a founder. And so that's been something personally that I've had to like figure out how to make work. Um, and so that's something that I would suggest. But I, I think it's you get into something and you think it's going to take a certain amount of money and you think it's going to take a certain amount of time and it always ends up being more. But the m more that we dive into it, the more I can see the different corollaries of the business that I may not have immediately thought of when we were just focused on beauty. Now we're having really interesting conversations about what real estate investment looks like, what community revitalization looks like, and the complexity of those conversations allows me to also see and chart a way forward for me that may not result in me going back to entertainment full time. So I think you just have to figure it out. But one thing that I had on the front end was a little bit of savings. And one thing that I regret I didn't do is in the context of the budget, really factor one of the three of us into it on the day to day. So I run um, two companies. So I'm a double entrepreneur. Is that a phrase? Uh, so I run Good, 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 which makes the good newspaper. I started that almost probably three years ago now. Uh, but for the last probably eight, nine years, I've been running Brandon Harvey Stories, which is just what my checks say, but I've never used that publicly. Um, and Brandon Harvey Stories is where I do 
social media consulting or public speaking or social media brand campaigns, things like that. And that's fully my income. So Brandon Harvey Stories is how I make my money, it's how I pay my rent, it's how I pay for my dog to eat bougie food from Portland. And uh, good, 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 I so far have not factored in a salary for myself. And uh, I'm, it's really good to hear you say this because Jeff and I were talking about this uh, last year and he's like, dude, you've got to build a salary into good, good, good because ultimately you're setting yourself up for your valuation, et cetera, to like not be accurate because, you know, I don't have plans to sell good, good, good at this point, but if I did, if somebody were to buy it, like they've got to be able to work at the company, you know, they can't also have another job. Uh, and so that's something I've been actively trying to figure out, but I also do feel like maybe this was the right decision for where we're at because uh, we're still bootstrapping and we're still small and we haven't raised funds yet. And so when that time comes, I can factor that into the budget. Um, on a kind of tangential note, I think everybody on my team, everybody that works with me, they all have another job outside of what I do or outside of what we do. And it creates a really unique atmosphere for our company. And I don't know if it's sustainable for everybody, but for some reason it's kind of working for us. Uh, and I think part of it is that everybody on our team, uh, it seems like they genuinely really like the work that we do. And it's, uh, it's a motivating factor for them where they're like, this is something I'm excited to pour my energy into. And I think that that goes a long way. Um, but it's, my goal is that, I mean, I, I know that, <laughs> so we make a, a, a literal print newspaper in 2019. Uh, this is not like a, a sustainable career for most anybody. You know, like I, I don't think anybody who works for me is thinking, oh, when I hope to retire here, <laughs> good, good, good. Uh, they know that it's, you know, a temporary thing to some degree, whether it's, you know, a decade or a, a few years. Um, but my goal is that for everybody that works on our team, that this sets them up for success with something else they want to do. And so I've tried to make it a point to see, okay, what's the goal of this person? Like, where are they going? And how can this be a really good item on their resume or a really good piece of their portfolio? Or how can I introduce them to the person who will hire them next? Uh, because I, I don't know, I, I guess I'm very fortunate in that because I know that this isn't a forever thing, or at least they probably won't be in that role forever. And, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a blessing on that front as well. Great answer. <laughs> um, this might not be a direct answer, but it's more of a philosophical answer, which is I've replaced the word money in my vocabulary with the word resource. So everybody in this room has a certain amount of resource that they are responsible of managing. And, um, you know, as resources grow in the company, I have an opportunity to, and the responsibility to manage a certain amount of resources. So, you know, as no matter if you're like stage one, you're just starting out, or you're like, you know, your company's massively growing, like it doesn't matter what stage you're at in the company, you are responsible as the leader to manage the resources that you've been given accordingly at the best of your abilities. Um, and that determined that, you know, salaries is a small part of that. And then, you know, managing it just overall, just running your company, like in, in the way that you give as a company, like you're managing resources that you've been given. And when you take the stigma out of like the word money and the power of this concept of money and you toss it out and you just replace it with, I am responsible of the resources that I've been given. And that could be in the realm of like actual currency and that could be in the realm of time and that could be in the realm of your team. Like you've been responsible with a certain amount of what you've been given and you as a leader have to decide how am I supposed to steward and manage what I've been given. Well done, Bob, that was a good answer. You get a prize. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, who else uh, has a question? Great, right here. I'm just curious how um, both patience and urgency play a role in what you're doing. I see, I, I, I can see where I wanna be so clearly. Like I, I know, I have a vision for this moment in what I want my company to look like. I know that it will be different and that things will change, but right now I know exactly how it is. And it's so frustrating to not be able to make that happen right away. 
And the one thing I'll say, because I have not figured out any of this, is that I am learning that sometimes I see this future that I want and it feels so far away that I forget that I have to start now to get there. And so even though it's a long journey, I need to start and take the steps necessary to build the path to get there. And so that's, yeah, that, that's, that's what I've got. <laughs> and I would say that's the difference between waiting and preparing. That's good. And I feel like, you know, there's many seasons in your life where you're like, man, I, f I fucking hate waiting. I just hate waiting around and waiting and waiting and waiting for something to happen. But the reality is if we just shift our mentality to like I'm waiting for something and we shift it to I'm preparing for something to happen, that is a powerful mentality that you can actually take on in your life. And that brings value to right now. Like what you do right now will determine how the future ends up, you know, what ends up happening in the future. What you do right now is going to determine your awareness to capitalize on opportunities as they arise. Like if you're not in a, a mentality of I'm preparing for the future and you're in a, a state of I'm just waiting, you're going to see opportunity come and go and you're going to miss it. Um, or you're just not going to be ready. So when opportunity comes, you're going to be startled and you're not going to have the capability to actually capitalize on that opportunity on the level that you should have capitalized on that opportunity. So I think that, uh, you know, I, I love replacing words, obviously, I'm just, but taking waiting out of your vocabulary and replacing it with preparing is such, that's an empower, uh, empowering mentality that, um, that you can truly take on right now. It brings purpose to right now and it makes the future so much more exciting because you're like, it's time and your money and everything that you're doing right now is an investment. You're not just spending time, you're investing time into something that will happen. Yeah, um, I think I feel that tension between patience and urgency right now as we think about what the next stage of growth looks like for the company. And we're, we feel really lucky and grateful that we have people, you know, outside of Detroit, all over the world really, that are rooting for, you know, essentially what started as a one blow dry salon in Detroit. And so with that comes all the questions. What does replication look like? Can you come to the city? Like what can you do here so that you can bring some of that like energy and that business here locally to the community? And so there's been this tension of being patient and waiting for the right capital to come because with those conversations comes dollars that you may or may not need. And right now it's like we're looking for a small investment of like 250,000 and people wanna write million dollar checks and I don't know if we need that money because I'm still tweaking and refining what we're doing to make sure that the version of it that scales is the right version. Also, all money is not created equal. It comes with a different set of conditions associated with it, you know. We had to pass on some money that I'm like, that is the most expensive $25,000 I have ever seen, like once you dive into the fine print. so. I feel this need to be patient and to make sure that when we grow, we grow in the appropriate manner and we wait for the right partners and we do the right kind of deal. Yet I feel this urgency of the moment that there's nobody doing it the way that we're doing it and if we don't, somebody else will, but isn't that okay and don't we want more models of good business, but also there's no one that would do it the way that we wanna do it and we really wanna do it. Um, and so we definitely feel that that relationship and really that tension between patience and urgency and how to grow and who to grow with and what kind of money to take on. So we're just, we're all in, in the middle of it right now. So <laughs> maybe see you on the other side. Yeah. That's great. I'm going to ask a question. Um, we're, we're a little aspirational. We're kind of high right now. So I'm going to nosedive back down into the dirt of all this stuff. All three of you have built great businesses uh, and you've also built great brands. So let's talk like marketing. I want like one, this is gonna sound cheesy. I want like your best like marketing hack. I mean, just like get as practical as you can. Like what's the one thing that if you can give a little piece of advice, what would it be? 
Bob, you're smiling like a Cheshire I'm, cat. I'm smiling. Like something. I'm Tell smiling because I can't wait for him to answer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll go. I'll go. Um, I'm about to take notes right now. <laughs> I think the most valuable thing we've done, we maybe did on accident, uh, and it was to create things that people want to share, and then to to make it valuable for that person to share. Like, it, it, it helps that person. Um, with the Good Newspaper, we made it beautiful so that people would leave it out on their coffee tables and people would ask about it. And it would be an opportunity to have a conversation about the deep things that we care about in the world. We make our social media posts informative, interesting, and exciting so that people want to repost them to their story and share good news with their friends, and that that would hopefully erase cynicism and fear and replace it with action and hope. Um, our podcasts are designed to be things that energize people and introduce them to new people so that when they follow those people on social media or buy their books, their lives are more fulfilling. And so all of that has been so effective. And, and a lot of it has been intentional, and a lot of it has been an accident. Uh, and I think really strategically within that, it's, it's about design, and it's about thinking about that end use of what's going to drive somebody to you know, take that action. I think for us, a lot of it has been find a like-minded partner and help them achieve their goals on social also in a way that we can present an opportunity that generates some value for our um, clients and community members. So like, what does that look like? For example, tomorrow, um, we're going to launch a, a full like kind of weekend of not really even programming at the salon, but just like music selection. I'm always talking about like, man, I miss old Kanye. Like, I just want to hang out with like the first three albums that he did, and then just you know take a walk around the block for the rest of it. And there is a venue, a music venue in Detroit the St. Andrews Hall that's having an I miss old Kanye party. And they're like, hey, we hear you talk about how you miss old Kanye. And for perspective, my first job was actually in music. So I worked at Island Def Jam like in the early days of Kanye. I literally walked the music videos over to MTV and BT. I was so incredibly invested. So it does come from a genuine place in any way. So they're doing an I love uh, old Kanye party. And so what we're gonna do is launch on our Instagram, hey, do you guys miss old Kanye? Come hang out at the salon over like the weekend. We're just gonna be playing the first three albums. We also have free tickets to the, I miss the old Kanye dance party. Come grab tickets, bring your friends. We'll see you there. If you sweat out your hair, come and see us next week. X amount of dollars off your blowout. That sort of a thing. So you have a brand that needs to essentially like pack a house, something that feels relevant to us it plays into the music that we have at the salon, and then there's an opportunity on the back end to essentially also promote services and tie it back to our core business. But we're able to do that by finding partners that have a way in which we can give value back to our clients that's not just X amount of dollars off of a blowout, it is thematically tied to this rebellious and kind of nature of our brand and music and dance and things that we like, so. That's awesome. Um, I would say my hack would be um, don't ever ask anybody to buy your product. And what I mean by that is I would say two examples is like if these guys were up here and they're like, I'm cool, they're not that cool. But if I'm like, yo, these guys are cool, then it's probably going to be bringing a little bit more validity <laughs> to them actually being cool. So if you're just like, as a brand, if you're like, hey, buy my product, buy my product, buy my product, it's like, honestly, it's gonna strip the power of like, nobody's gonna wanna buy your product. The power is like, you never using your ask for anybody to actually buy your product. So that means that you need to find people to actually endorse your product and like actually help promote and say how dope your product actually is. That's not you, because that's not cool. Um, I wanna butt in really quick and just yeah. say, Bob and I were here at Plywood last year, and I followed Bob and Sat Sackcloth and Ashes on Instagram since probably they launched. 
Uh, and he mentioned, he said, you know, we've never asked people to buy our product. And I scrolled through their Instagram and he's not lying. They've never asked for it. And they make 50 times what we make. And we ask people to buy our product. And I forgot that you told me that. And I meant to stop asking people. So <laughs> maybe, maybe we'll stop. Yeah, the, 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 power, the power is not in the asking. The power is in the sharing. And so if you can tell a good narrative, if you can tell a good story, if you can share about your product, that's different than asking people to really buy good. your product. Uh, so it's number one, get fine. Like I've built the brand for the first four years paying influencers on Instagram um, to create the best of the best content and promote us. But Sackcloth was never promoting itself. Like we pride ourselves in like, we had like 65 cents in our PR spend or something on our, bud, or our, on our books one year. And like my team was like, what the hell does this 65 cents go to? Um, and it was like, we never use money typically to promote ourselves. It, 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 unless it's like we're actually collaborating with somebody to create high quality content and then to promote that content through their feed and they happen to be promoting our product. And so that's one way. The second thing is to just share a good story. And if you share a good story and you inspire people, you're gonna sell product. Like um, the stories that we're trying to tell right now is I'm spending about a third of my time going to different um, homeless shelters around the United States. And we're using our platform as a brand to highlight people and organizations that are actually doing something about homelessness. And when we were partnering with World Market and we're sitting in this meeting and World Market's like, we wanna shoot a commercial, you know, we wanna, you know, and I'm like, look, if you wanna shoot a commercial, here's what we need to do. We need to shoot a commercial in the Tenderloin of San Francisco, which is where they're headquartered at. We need to highlight City Impact and the incredible work that they're doing. And like, we're gonna sell product. Like, if you're worried about selling product, like we're gonna sell product if we tell City Impact's story. Like the dope work that City Impact is doing in the Tenderloin needs to be heard. You have a massive platform, we got a platform, let's share their story and we're gonna sell product. We're gonna sell blankets just fine if we tell good stories. Um, and so be a brand that's focused, focused on telling good stories. Don't ask people to buy your product. That's the number one hack. Don't ask, just share. Bob, a couple years ago, I went to the world's worst comedy show in New York City. It was one of these like walk-in clubs where they're like giving out free coupons on the sidewalk. And the show was so bad, we sat there for a couple hours and at one point, the comedian is up there and no one's laughing and he begins like uh, chastising the audience for not laughing. And I was so insulted because I'm like, you're the comedian, it's your job to make me laugh. And to me that's the same, it's the same deal as it's like marketing is the same way. Yeah. Laughter is a response to humor, a purchase should be a response to a good story as opposed to shouting at the customer, you need to laugh or you need to buy, you know, similar kind of deal. So I chimed in. Brandon, that's, you wanna add just, to that? I, I just think it's so good. I just think that's an amazing idea. And I'm like not even fully present for a second because I'm just processing through it. Oh my gosh, we're gonna change this, we're gonna change this, we're gonna change this. Are you gonna, yeah, I mean, to some degree, I feel like you could still, I would, if you tell me to like go buy, like to, to you know, go buy your shop, I'm gonna go buy it. Like, can you, I don't know, do you imagine a world where you can not ask people to come by? Yeah, I think we always, anytime there is some sort of an, an ask to our clients, it's in the context of like offering availability for open appointments, mm. like we're trying to meet a need that they have. What's really interesting is that from a merch standpoint, anytime like we put our name on something where it was a candle that we developed, a t-shirt, like a recyclable bag, we never really talk about the fact that we're trying to sell them. We just use them in storytelling or show where they pop up and then they sell out almost immediately and then we have to make more. So what's interesting is that we've never really, and to your point, like we focused on telling a really good story and I think that people feel passionate about the brand so they support it in a way that they can, especially if they aren't in Detroit, but it does really make me think about the fact that it makes sense to really double down on that even as we think about how to 
like launch in other markets, perhaps some markets that we might be in before we have physical locations and stores, but might have a network of nonprofit partners and you know maybe it's a series of pop-ups and different merch that accompanies that, that it really is about making sure that we're telling and reflecting the stories of those markets and not testing a market to see if it makes sense to launch a blow-dry salon. And you only have so many asking chips. Like, as soon as you run out of asking chips, you go bankrupt. And I can tell you right now, like, if you showed me a brand on Instagram, I could look at their account and pretty much tell you right now, like, whether they've plateaued or not and whether they've gone bankrupt. Not in the financial sense, but just in a brand sense. Like, a lot of people are trying to avoid bankruptcy in a financial sense, but just avoid bankruptcy in a brand sense. And um, people are very financial focused. And if you focus on the brand, telling a good story, you're gonna be prosperous, not just financially, but in the brand. And that, if you can be prosperous in your brand, you're gonna have a lot of leverage in the financial realm. Very good, thanks guys. We have time for about two more questions. Anyone else have one they wanna jump in with? Anything else? Cool. All right, do you guys have any final parting thoughts or words? Anything you're like just burning to tell us? Wise words. Nia, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> love it, love it. Um, I would maybe be speechless, but I did think of something as you were kicking it wow. to me. And it's, <laughs> it's because someone asked me the other day, are there any sort of like words that you live by? And when, back when I was in um, New York working at Viacom, I used to have on a post-it note taped to like my laptop, a simple saying, and it said, remember why you started. And it, in many respects, was what kind of caused me to leave, you know, corporate media and entertainment and pursue another pathway. But I've always used those words as sort of like a, a check-in of where I am and if it makes sense and if I'm still on track. And one of the first things um, from an aesthetic and design standpoint that we, um, that we had in the salon was we commissioned this neon sign maker and this saying said, bloom where you are planted. And to me, it was sort of an evolution of remember why you started, because the answer was to go back and build something in the community that I was from. And so it's not the same sticky note, but I get to walk by it every day when I'm in Detroit. And it's a reminder that you're here and back and doing important work, but it also serves as like a gut check, especially on the days when you're like, why did I even start? It's bloom where you were planted, come back and do what's important, build something that matters. I'll jump in with something. Um, one of the most beneficial things for me, one of the most valuable things in the process of being an entrepreneur, and especially being an entrepreneur where I put things on the internet and a bunch of people see it, has been having close friends who don't care at all about the work I do. It's been so refreshing and so helpful, and I'm so grateful for that. Um, you know, we, we talk a lot about Fred Rogers, and when the documentary came out, which it should have made everybody in this room cry, and if it didn't, uh, we'll get that checked out. Um, but we did a lot of promotion around that, and a lot of celebration around that, and, you know, a year later, and it's out on Amazon Prime, uh, my best friend Colin texts me, and he's like, Dude, so there's this amazing new uh, Mr. Rogers documentary out, and I think you'd really like it. I remember you saying that you, you, you really like this stuff. And I love the fact that like Colin knew me enough to know that I would love this movie, but he like didn't care at all about any of the stuff we were sharing on social media, enough to like know that we were promoting this. And it's been so like refreshing and helpful. And so find those people in your life. Uh, cherish the fact that they don't, care at all about your entrepreneurial journey, but they just care about you as a human. Uh, and in the times where you don't know if you're gonna make it or when things are hard, uh, you should turn to them because it's, it's the best thing in the world. I would say um, I'll share something that's kind of been coming up consistently in a lot of conversations of mine and and kind of what I feel like is sticking in audiences that I've been speaking to, which is consistence is greater than resistance. Like if you have an idea and you believe in something, 
and you're consistent in it, whatever that is, like it could be something small or it could be something large, like whatever you're consistent in, like as long as you are consistent every single day and you're pursuing something, that's going to outweigh and become stronger than any resistance that you will face. And we're hit constantly. Like none of us are exempt from difficult circumstances. None of us are exempt from really hard things happening and resistance hitting us. But as long as we are consistent in the work that we do, in the belief that we have, and we show up every day and we say yes, that is way more powerful than any kind of resistance that you will face in your entire life. And I really believe that you will achieve what you want to achieve as long as you are consistent in showing up every day. I love it. Guys, this is like the classic way to close out a podcast, so we're not podcasting, but what is the one online destination if folks want to find you guys just very quickly? Is it Instagram, your website? Just Bob. Yeah, at good, good, good. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. That's it. All right. Brandon, do you have anything to add to that? No. Okay. All right. <laughs> Nia? Um, the, the brand is at Detroit Blows. Detroit Blows? Detroit Blows. B-L-O-W-S. B-L-O-W-S. All right, I'm making sure I was hearing <laughs> you correctly. Sounds good. Guys, this was really cool. You guys are great. Thank you for sharing with us. Give them, give them a round of applause. You can follow Sat Sackcloth and Ashes on Instagram as well. I just want to clarify this. <laughs>